and welcome to this worship service of the Laurel Presbyterian Church. My name is Sue Holly. Today, Bob Patterson and I are the elders of the day. We hope you are remaining safe and enjoying this beautiful weather. This week, we will meet for morning prayers on Wednesday, August 26th at 8.30 a.m. under the tree at LPC. Each week, we remember a friend at home. And this week, our friend at home is Charlie Wentling. I know he would enjoy a call, a card, or an email to let him know that you are thinking of him. Whether this is your first time worshiping with us or you join us every Sunday, may something in today's service bring you peace and comfort and remind you how profoundly God loves you. Let us worship together. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This morning's responsive reading is from Romans 12, verses 1 through 8. So, brothers and sisters, because of God's mercies, I encourage you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. This is your appropriate spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you can figure out what God's will is, what is good and pleasing and mature. Because of the grace that God gave me, I can say to each one of you, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think. Instead, be reasonable, since God has measured out a portion of faith to each one of you. We have many parts in one body, but the parts don't all have the same function. In the same way, though there are many of us, we are one body in Christ, and individually, we belong to each other. We have different gifts that are consistent with God's grace that has been given to us. If your gift is prophecy, you should prophesy in proportion to your faith. If your gift is service, devote yourself to serving. If your gift is teaching, devote yourself to teaching. If your gift is encouragement, devote yourself to encouraging. The one giving should do it with no strings attached. The leader should lead with passion. The one showing mercy should be cheerful. Hi everybody. I'm trying this experiment where you can see all of me because today I want to talk about what Paul says about what it means to belong to each other. So Paul was one of the very first Christians. The very first. One of the very, very first. And he talks about how being part of the church is like being part of the body of Christ. So I want you to look at your own body, right? Look at your finger your finger. It belongs to you, right? If your finger gets hurt, you hurt. Look at your knee. Think about your knee. If it doesn't work right, none of you really can work right. You can't walk so easily. And I thought about all this because my sister broke her big toe in three places. This is what it looks like. So my sister said she never really thought much about her toe until she stumbled down some stairs and her full body weight landed on her left big toe and it hurts so, so much to do anything. It's all she can think about now. Now you might not think your big toe is all that important. You may not think about your big toe very much at all because it just works for you, right? Only if you stub it or you hurt it do you think about your big toe. But I want you to stand up right now and try to walk without using your big toes, right? Lift your big toes up and see how you can walk. It doesn't work so well, does it? You kind of have to walk stiff-legged. And you probably couldn't get too far if you tried to do that. Now, try to kneel down without using your big toe, right? See if you can do that. It's pretty hard. Your big toe apparently does a lot to help us balance. And now try jumping. Go ahead and use your big toe, but pay attention to your big toe as you jump. I'm gonna jump. If I didn't have a big toe on each foot to help jump me up and catch me when I come back down, I couldn't jump very well. And so Paul reminds us that we are all part of the body of Christ and every single one of us is important. Even the parts of us we don't think about that much. Even the people we don't think about that much. Everyone is so important. And during these times, 
we're being shown people who are really important. It didn't occur to us before maybe to think about the people who put our groceries on the shelves for us. Maybe we didn't think about how truckers are the ones who bring our groceries to us. Maybe we didn't think that much about the people working in the hospital. We didn't think that much about all the people trying to figure out how to keep us safe. Because it's a hard time right now. It's a hard time when we have to think about each other. And that's how God made us. God made us, as we'll hear Paul say, to belong to each other. That means we look out for each other because we all belong to God and we're all one family. So imagine what life would be like without your big toe. You could do it, just wouldn't be very easy and it wouldn't be very fun. So what else have you not thought about that you need every day, that you take for granted, that you don't think about? Think about that as you go through the rest of today. Think about the people who made your toothpaste, the people who picked your banana, the people who keep your street clean, and say a prayer of thank you to God for them. Because we could live without that, but it wouldn't be very easy and it wouldn't be very fun. Thanks be to God. So Paul tells the Romans, don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you can figure out what God's will is, what is good and pleasing and mature. And Paul's telling us it takes figuring out. It's not always obvious. And he goes on to caution us not to think too highly of ourselves. It sounds like he's got some personal experience with this, maybe with his own thinking too highly of himself, his own inflated ego, perhaps. He knows how egotistical people can wreck a community, can interfere with living faithfully with one another and with God when they put themselves ahead of everything and anything else. And he goes on to say, Paul does, individually, we belong to each other. What a time for this passage to show up in the lectionary. What a mysterious, serendipitous work of the Holy Spirit to have this be the verse for this season of our life here in the United States, as we seek to be and to act as the Christians we claim to be, as we try to figure out what God's will for us is. It's not always clear to us human beings because right now, the patterns of this world as exercised by those with power are on full display because right now lies are being told to play on our fears on our suspicions on our paranoia turn us against one another because right now we need to be mature as we move forward it's the only way to gird ourselves from being pulled down into the muck and ugliness of our world today now, you all know I'm no big fan of Paul, and I sure wasn't a big fan of the founder of Presbyterianism, John Calvin, when I read his Institutes back in seminary, but it's almost like the scales are falling from my eyes. I'm seeing they may not have been so far off when they reminded us, mortals, how bad we can be. Because selfishness, and greed, and using power to build up bank accounts and reputations and grab more power and hurt people and creation, destroying anything you think doesn't matter because it doesn't matter to you, it's all on full display for us. It's taken me decades to recognize that maybe John Calvin was right. Total depravity is a thing, is a, it is real and it is dangerous, and it is everywhere. 
Now, to be fair, John Calvin and Paul also said that God's enduring and steadfast and eternal grace is also a thing, is also real, is also everywhere, and is the only thing that will save us. And that grace is for every single person, not just a chosen few, in spite of what you've maybe heard about Calvin and Paul. But Paul warns us, the patterns of this world are powerful. And unless we use our minds to resist them, grace will be hard to see. Grace will be invisible to us. The patterns of the world will consume us. Hearts, minds, bodies, souls. Serene Jones, in her book, Call It Grace, she pulls an example from her 11-year-old 11, 11 birthday party when she was living in Texas in the early 1970s. She pulls us this example to show us how pervasive the patterns of this world. So imagine all her friends are in the car and they're all heading to the pool for her party when they discover the pool's closed for maintenance. And her dad sits there for a minute and then he says, well, we'll have to go to Highland Lakes Pool. And Serene, turning 11, already disappointed, blurts out, oh, gross, I don't want to swim with black people. And the patterns of the world fly right out of her mouth in spite of her father's passionate and dedicated and public work for civil rights in spite of how often she saw black friends of her parents in her house, in spite of how often they had told her, everyone is equal in God's sight. No one is better than anyone else. In the moment of 11-year-old frustration and longing to fit in with her friends, she just knew, she just knew that they were thinking the same thing she was and were relieved that she had been the one to say it. A disappointing birthday that was not turning out at all how she had planned and the patterns of the world burst from her mouth. President of Union Theological Seminary in New York, so she's very well known, the brutal ugly honesty that Serene reveals about herself in this book, it took my breath away that she would write down what she said for strangers to read and judge all these decades later, judge her. But her point is this, the patterns of this world are inside us. They are in the air we breathe, the water we drink, the ground we walk on. They are pounding on us day and night. They are so inside us, we don't even know it. So we don't even question it. And so the rules to this life, the world's patterns, according to the world, these are the rules. If you can manipulate the system to serve you, no matter who gets hurt or destroyed in the process. Take what you can, honestly, or if you think you can do it without getting caught dishonestly. You are entitled to take it if you are smart enough to figure that out, figure out how. Treat other human beings not only as less important than you, but mere obstacles standing in your way. Let fear dictate your beliefs and your actions and how you treat people. It's all about what's good for you and yours in the short term, with little thought to anyone else or anyone coming behind you or the consequences on anyone else's life. And Paul, who had no idea that we'd be pouring over his words these 2,000 plus years later, searching, longing for good news, looking, looking for the way forward. He shows us the way of faith. I listened to Michelle Obama's speech this week. Maybe you're one of the few Americans who don't think too highly of her, but I kept thinking, as I listened to her, did she know that Romans 12, 1 through 8 was this week's lectionary passage? 
because she described the patterns of the world on display right now so well. She said, people shouting in grocery stores, unwilling to wear a mask to keep us all safe. People calling the police on folks minding their own business just because of the color of their skin. An entitlement that says only certain people belong here, that greed is good and winning is everything, because as long as you come out on top, it doesn't matter what happens to everyone else. And a lack of empathy ginned up into outright disdain. Because that is what is bombarding us over and over and over again right now. These are the patterns the world is offering us. But she echoed Paul's call when she called us to resist the patterns of the world, to let the transformation of our minds show us the way of God's love. Now, she didn't use any of those words, but that's what I heard. Because she called us to stand fierce against hatred while remembering we are one nation under God. And if we want to survive, We've got to find a way to live together and work together across our differences. This is not easy. It requires being savvy and smart and quick and thoughtful to spot what's going on all around us. I, for one, was taken in this week by a pastor who wanted to talk with me about a march. And I naively assumed he was organizing clergy to join a march in Laurel you know, to stand against the hatred we're seeing and the abuse of power in our democracy, stand for the right of everyone to vote. I was wrong. I only discovered it when I just happened to ask him for his email address. He spelled it out for me. J-S-A at billygram.org. Wow, did that stop me in my tracks cold as I politely but directly asked him how Franklin Graham was affiliated. Yes, I am that naive. It didn't occur to me that he was the president of the organization. And then I explained that Franklin Graham does not stand for the Christian values I hold and that I could not participate in a march that supported what I saw as the abuse of the gospel for personal gain, the abuse of the gospel to keep women in their place, to discriminate against LGBTQ folk. I may have also mentioned something about his personal jet. I wish I'd mentioned his personal worth of $12 million. Right now, we have so many people using the gospel whenever and however it suits them claiming to be Christian. But remember what Paul said? We must be transformed by the renewing of our minds if we're going to figure out how to live the will of God, which Jesus teaches is love. Oh yeah, and Paul goes on. We belong to each other. We belong to each other. If we belong to each other, if we're not to think too highly of ourselves, if, as we will sing in a few minutes, they will know we are Christians by our love and we will protect each one's dignity and guard each one's pride, if this is what we believe, then we have to be honest about what is happening right now in our country at the hands of the current administration because it is not Christian. It is not Christ-like. And Michelle Obama's speech went on to quote John Lewis, the great civil rights leader who said, when you see something that is not right, you must say something. You must do something. That there is some good Presbyterian theology. Because, as Michelle puts it, that is the truest form of empathy. Not just feeling, but doing. Not just for ourselves and our kids, but for everyone. For all our kids, because this is who we still are. Compassionate, resilient, 
decent people whose fortunes are bound up with one another. Our fortunes are bound up with one another. Paul can get behind that statement. We Presbyterians are reformed, always reforming, which means we're open to changing our minds. Actually, what it really means is we expect our minds to be changed. How will you resist the patterns of the world? First, you have to recognize lies when they are told. How will you let your mind be transformed? We have to let God take our minds and think through them. How will you know what is the will of God? This way. Is it loving? Is it right? Is it good? Is it mature? Does it put God's love ahead of everything else, everything else, even ahead of your own best interests? Because we are promising one another and we are promising our maker, they will know we are Christians by our love. May it be so.